Hello and welcome to the Kamla Show. We bring you interviews and conversations with technologists, entrepreneurs, filmmakers, and other news from in and around the San Francisco Bay Area. My guest today is Dr. Pramit Sinha. He divides his time between the US and India, but mostly you are based in India. And I'm going to quickly give an introduction. Dr. Pramit Sinha is an engineer, educator, and entrepreneur. I guess that'll be the order. And he is also a senior counselor at Albright uh, Stonebridge and uh, strategic consulting company based in Washington, DC. And he's the author of a book about the Indian business school. And uh, we'll start off with a comment, uh, uh, a quote that is there in your book. One can resist invasion by an army, but no resistance can be made against an idea whose time has come. You grew up in a printing press. Yes, I did. Uh, so both your father and grandfather were writers? Yes, my father, my grandfather, actually my great-grandfather as well were all Hindi writers. How did they get to start writing? Uh, I think my great-grandfather used to just be a poet uh, in, in what was called Braj Bhasha mm. in those days because Hindi had not actually come, come in. Mm. Uh, but then my grandfather uh, got a proper education. He was actually a student at Calcutta University mm. and there he became very interested in languages and I guess he had it in his DNA and he started writing in Hindi. Of course, he also wrote in Bengali and in Urdu uh, and then my father, I guess, must have picked up from him and started writing in Hindi as well. And so you, for you, thinking and writing kind of was, you were introduced early on. I was, but my writing, I'm, I'm a black sheep in the family. I don't write. How come? Uh, well, I, I, I've written a book about the creation of the Indian School of Business, but that hardly counts for the kind of writing. I read the first few pages. It was, you know, it was well written, so. Well, thank you. Then I may have a future. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a lot of future. Now, you, you, we started off with the Victor Hugo uh, quote about uh, the an idea whose time has come. Now, this is something that Prime Minister Singh had mentioned when he had come to visit uh, President Obama as his first state uh, yes, guest. Yes. Do you think the time has come for India? You know, the time has come for India for some time now. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, we, we like to believe we are a 5,000-year-old civilization. Uh, but I think as a country, we are only 70 years old. Mm. Uh, and uh, as a functioning democracy. Uh, but as, uh, as an economy, and I think that's what you're referring to, uh, I think we are really only 24 years old. Uh, in 1991 is when the economic liberalization happened, and in a way we kind of pressed restart at that point in time. And I think since then we've always talked about the fact that our time has come. Uh, I think the time uh, is still there. Mm. Uh, I think the opportunity for India to uh, really grow and develop itself is still very much there. Uh, I think the struggle seems to be that you don't quite know when we will be able to declare that we are there or that we are well on our way to be there. The world also doesn't know. Neither does yes. do the people know. Yes, the, 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 the promise has always been there. The delivery has always been short of the promise. But that's where the downfall is, when you don't uh, deliver. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, but I think uh, either we are being over optimistic, but uh, I think there is enough happening or uh, there's always enough going on that gives you the confidence that the potential and the promise is for real. Mm. And that if you just work that extra bit and you do that extra bit, that you will actually get there. And I think that's the mood that you still find, particularly with uh, Prime Minister Modi coming to power with so much energy and vision and, 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 and positive feeling. So Prime Minister Modi came to power about a year ago. Yes. And he got a huge mandate from the people. Yes. They wanted a change in government, a change in vision, uh, a change in everything. Sure. So he's the man who's supposed to be the change maker. Right. Uh, what has he done so far that gives you the confidence that India may you know, finally become that economic uh, power? Well, you know, we started out, as I said, about 24 years ago. Uh, and I think we had a decade or so of very strong economic growth. Uh, I think 
post that we kind of floundered because when the BJP lost its big election because of India shining or they thought India shining would win them an election and they lost it. I think we all retreated into a bit of a shell and, and, and politics much became much more centered around inclusion and development. Uh, and of course you have to do that. Uh, but I, I think we are all struggling with striking the right balance between economic growth and inclusive development. Which means by implication uh, uh, more of a leftist or a yeah, socialist. Yeah, I mean traditionally this was associated with a more leftist or socialist attitude but I don't think there's any, uh, uh, I don't think you should, qu we should qualify it as that. I think it's so quite capitalist today also to think about education, health uh, and poverty being alleviated through uh, economic growth. Uh, and I'm not an expert, so don't uh, hold me to these terms. But uh, what I was trying to get to is that we, we swung away from focusing only on growth to focusing only on development, which was good for the country in some ways, but it put us back in terms of our economic growth. I think he's now trying to revive and change that. And what is your reading of why that swing happened? Was it because they wanted to capture the votes, which is a very yes. important uh, thing yeah. in India? Yes, you know, I think as Ram Guha, a, f a famous historian, always says, India is really an experiment. In you know, when we started as a country 70 years ago, our founders took a huge leap of faith and said, "We'll give universal franchise to everyone, regardless of who they are, whether they are untouchables or women." Uh, whereas most part of the world, you know, even if uh, a vote was uh, a franchise was uh, given to people, they they, they were segregated. Uh, so we took a bold experiment uh, with a relatively uneducated country uh, and as Ram says you know we are in a, this is an experiment that is still in the making. So on one hand we've solved the, the fact that we really are a functioning democracy uh, and functioning very. Which is a huge. Uh, yes I mean we have uh, on last count some you know 160 political parties. Uh, you know, 800 plus million people voted in a free and fair election um, just one year ago. So it's massive. Mm. Never in the history of humanity has something at this scale been, at this scale of democracy been practiced. Mm. Uh, so on that front, we've actually done very well. But that then uh, subverts the decision making system in the government where every five years you have to face an election and people are second guessing what people will vote for. I think now it's very clear that people want both jobs, but they also want development uh, from a basic uh, needs perspective. And I think our governments have been uh, uh, have been seesawing in terms of focusing on one or the other, and they are trying to stri strike the right balance. So for the last ten years, I've I've had this feeling that we went too far into pacifying the development side and not getting the uh, the, the economic growth side going and I think Mr. Modi is trying to revive the economic growth side while not letting go of the development agenda. Mm. And so to therefore your question of what he has done, I think one of the things he's done is a lot of our development programs were bleeding us, uh, money was being wasted. So having removed the diesel subsidy, having created the Jan Dhan program where everybody has a bank account, putting money straight into those accounts so that the subsidy on LPG cylinders is removed and, and so money no goes. So there's no third party. Right. And the money goes directly to people uh, putting in health insurance for uh, people and so on is uh, actually a move in the right direction and you should also uh, give credit where it's due. These were programs that were started by the earlier government and he's carried them through and so on. But I think what is uh, what we are all waiting and watching is is the on the economic front what can he get going because we've been in a bit of a limbo for many years as you know. Now there too uh, some significant things have happened. It's not like he has not, you know, one is that I think his focus on manufacturing, uh, his focus on digital India, his focus on skilling India are all moves in the right direction. His focus on smart cities are, are huge programs and, and you know from either the history of the United States and other countries that, you know, these programs really drive economic growth. Like what FDR did during Correct. World Depression so, and World War So the War II. question is, I think he has the vision, he's got the right ideas. Now the onus is on the rest of our country to execute. And I think that's where we are struggling right now because, uh, you know, we've become a very complex country and it's a very complex center state relationship.
uh, execution happens at the state level. The central government has no agency to drive implementation and execution. Uh, a lot of our projects have been held up in the past because of land acquisition issues, environmental clearance issues and so on. A lot of them are mired in legal cases, our banks have lent to uh, projects that are unviable and are sitting on bad debts. So unlocking and unclogging this whole thing I believe is going to have a, a time lag and, and it has been seen in history that you know actual investments and action on the ground is all always lags the reforms right uh, takes some time right I think we were all so pent up and, and so anxious to see results that we were all hoping that he would come in and do some miracles but he's methodically laying the yes. ground so I think he's putting those things in place and it is true if you look at it very objectively there's still question marks about whether things are happening or not uh, but equally if you look at the indicators and if you look at the actions he's taking uh, even with the constraints of not having majority in the upper house and things like GST and others getting stuck, I think he's done a he, he's putting in place the right uh, building blocks. Mm. Uh, I also feel that you know this is our only chance. Uh, if you look around, who is the other leader, uh, and where will we ever get a stronger mandate than, than what Modi? he's than he has got? So you know we all have to root for his success. Uh, because I think if we are again going to be saddled by uh, a, a leader who is weak, uh, a political party in rule uh, that is not is dependent on coalitions and so on, we are again going to go through a period of uh, delayed gratification. So this is uh, the moment where. So in that sense, uh, it, you know, I I know that. Uh, the, 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 when, when, when a foreigner looks at India, they say, you guys keep talking about the time has come every time we talk to you. So when is the time coming? <laughs> so do Indians have a different definition of time? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that we do. Uh, but I, I really do think that uh, this is from a, from a different way in which Victor Hugo said it. Uh, I, I think we, if this time it doesn't happen, then I really worry about us. So uh, it's the Indian stretchable time. Yes, and but more than that, I, I, I think on a more serious note, I think uh, if, if if this is the only time mm. uh, that we have, because I I also believe and, and and I've often talked about this that somewhere our challenges are going to start overcoming us. Challenges and of what? Of of providing jobs, of providing education, of building infrastructure. Because you've built care. this aspirational society. Yeah, and the numbers and the aspirations are growing exponentially. Uh, and if we don't make a big dent on meeting those aspirations, the analogy I like to use is that, you know, most of the time we've been playing a five day cricket match mm. and we are happy to play for a draw. Mm. Uh, at least you are not losing. Mm. Uh, but I think the world has changed, uh, people's aspirations have changed. They expect a, a, a win like in a, in a limited overs match. Mm. And when you're playing a game against a opposition and you have to, they've already batted and they've set the target, you know, you need double digit economic growth, you mean a million jobs a month uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, the asking rate is growing with every over, with every year, with every uh, Hmm. Dec uh, every uh, five-year uh, regime of, of a government. And I think it will get to a point where the ASCII rate just gets too high. Uh, so how do you break this log jam? Because as you were talking, I was thinking of how China broke its log jam. In the 70s, it had the four modernization, I believe 80s, the four modernization, which is what it's reaping benefits today. It's still politically, it's not, uh, you know, it's not a democratic uh, country. India is the opposite, you know. Yeah, and I think therefore we shouldn't even compare, and we can't learn lessons from China because we we will never give up our democratic system. No, but economically, can we learn something from uh, China? I think there is enough that we have learned. I think uh, the question is really of decision making. I think the economic models are the same. I don't think the economic models are very different. I think th there may be some differences in that China took a m much more manufacturing approach. Well, we've accepted that and we are saying now let's focus on manufacturing because we leapfrog from agriculture straight to services. 
I think China took a very FDI-driven approach. I think we are trying to do that as well. China prided itself in the fact that it was much more export-driven. India prides itself in the fact that it's more internal consumption-driven. So I think, but these all come out of similar economic theories. I, I don't think there's any debate about that. I think the real issue is the solutions are known, the paths are known. The question is, can we quickly decide and go and execute? Mm. And that's what holds us back is because, as I said, we've chosen a certain way of governing ourselves, uh, which is very fragmented than most demo democracies. I if you have a problem in, in the US uh, with a two-party system, imagine what we have with a you know, hundred-party system. Mm. Uh, and so I think what is happening uh, is that uh, the the only way is that we have to somewhere try and replicate the China-like decision making, if if which that's is, what yes, you uh, have which to. is almost impossible. Uh, but uh, again, uh, with a more decisive uh, prime minister like Mr. Modi, who's very clear, uh, with a very clear mandate for his party, uh, uh, with a very clear. Uh, majority in the upper house, which we hope will come in, in the course of the next uh, couple of years, uh, you know, he then has all the tools uh, to be more decisive than what previous regimes were, but he will never be able to exercise the same decision making powers that the Chinese have. Mm. Talking about execution, you are a man who has executed not one, not two, but now almost a third university, I think. So the first university that you started at the turn of the century, you and a bunch of other people who went to IIT or IIMs and, you know, you all achieved success in your own way, but decided to open a business school in India when it was not even possible of opening a new university. And then last year you opened another university, Ashoka University, but a liberal education, a liberal college, which is again something uh, that is unheard of in India because liberal education is frowned upon most of the time in India. What did you learn from your execution and working with the government? Because you, you and your team have shown that it is possible if you apply your mind. Correct. Uh, well, it's very difficult to get things done in India and that everybody will tell you. Uh, it takes much longer to execute things in India than you would, uh, than it should take. Uh, but equally, I think if you are well-intentioned, you uh, are passionate and you are deliberate and you do things in a well-planned manner, uh, things do get done. Uh, and so you are absolutely right. Uh, in the period of the last 15 years, uh, I think I, if I look at these two projects, the Indian School of Business or, or Ashoka University, uh, we've been able to do that uh, despite all the challenges and all the problems uh, that uh, people encounter. Uh, I think we need many more projects but like that. But how did you overcome those problems or challenges? Just did you think differently? Of course. Uh, I mean, I think we, we have innovated multiple times uh, in each of these projects. Uh, I think we've uh, taken an approach that sort of uh, challenges the status quo. Mm. Uh, but I think we've also uh, set a very high bar for the quality of what we are going to deliver. Mm. Uh, and 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 done it in a fairly selfless and a uh, and a you know non uh, uh, non commercial manner, and I think that really won the trust of the government and all the stakeholders who all then kind of rose to support us. Hmm. We always found a good political leader who backed us, whether it was Chandra Babu Naidu in uh, the state of uh, Andhra Pradesh in those days or. Uh, Mr. Huda, who was the chief minister in Haryana, uh, and we never had to pay any money to anybody. Uh, people really supported us, and you know these people always wanted good things for their state, for the country. And when they knew that uh, we were all uh, doing it for the right reason, they all rose to support us. Mm -hmm. It is also true that despite having their support, uh, it took us longer than it should have. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's a bit sad, but you know, it's it the 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 thing here is that on one hand you can be happy about mm. the fact that we got these done, but the sad part is that not not many others have had happened in this time. 
uh, and and that is really the sad part uh, but about but uh, in the last two years apparently 24 private universities have been given permission to open in india yeah actually there may have been uh, 24 or more actually okay. uh, uh, and some of them are uh, are, are are very well intentioned uh, and are going to come but up quality with. is not uh, I think the quality is going to be better and better okay. uh, because our people are learning from others' experiences. I think people watch what we have done at ISB and at Ashoka and they, they want to emulate that. So I think we are setting a bar. I think the existing institutions have also uh, improved. I think if you look at what has happened with uh, the success of ISB is that IIMs have also started you know, similar programs and uh, started to bring in better faculty and, and upgrade themselves. Mm. So I think overall, uh, it goes back to what I was saying before, you, you would like to th see things happen faster. Uh, you'd like to see many more people uh, doing these things. But because it is hard uh, and because it is difficult, uh, one is that it takes longer and the other is that other people are wary of, of doing similar things. Mm. Tell us what, uh, uh, what inspired you and your team to come up with Ashoka because you started the business school, but why a liberal college? and that too on the outskirts of uh, Delhi and it is modeled from what I understand uh, after an American kind of System. college. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, uh, th there's a, there was a bunch of friends who were talking to me. One group was talking about setting up a super duper IIT where there would be great research and great scholarly work happening. Their worry was that IITs had become too much of teaching institutions and weren't doing enough fundamental research. There was another group of friends that was talking to me about the idea of uh, reviving the study of liberal arts in India. Uh, and as we got together, we decided that let's pool our, our, our ideas and resources and build a university. Uh, at that time, we were not really focused on a liberal ed university and liberal education. Uh, we were going to do a full scale university with multiple schools and you know business school and engineering school and so on. Uh, but uh, it so happened that uh, we started to take uh, stock of what it would cost to build something like that. And we were a bit daunted by the fact that it was a big Wait, fundraising much, challenge for how us. How much would it cost you? You know, it could end up costing you a billion dollars to, you know, build something like that. And this and, is and, 20 and, million? And, and, and well, this will probably end up uh, being uh, more, uh, more like, uh, 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 you know, uh, 150, 200 million over time. Hmm. Uh, but at that time, uh, also the financial crisis happened and none of us were rich enough to endow the whole school. Uh, we always knew that we had to follow what we call a collective philanthropy model uh, and raise money from lots of people. Ashoka to date has about 65 donors uh, who have helped us. Uh, and so uh, we went back to the drawing board and said, what do we want to really do here uh, that solves an unsolved problem? Uh, that is distinctive, that stands out, uh, uh, which, which will capture people's imagination. Uh, and what is it that we really feel that we need to do? And as, as we went back to the drawing board, we all realized that we were not really wedded to one kind of school or college or, 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 or program. But what we really wanted to do was uh, uh, create a model where we would have graduates who were well-rounded. Uh, and it would answer a lot of the criticism that people have of graduates in India that they don't think well, they are they, they don't speak well, they are poor communicators, they are entitlement oriented, uh, you know, our system is doing a really poor job. And as we examined what those things were that we valued about ourselves or people that we hired, it all pointed to the qualities that you would see in a person who came out of a liberal education that they were good critical thinkers, that they were analytical in their approach, that they were great communicators, uh, that they had great uh, leadership skills, uh, and they had some sort of a commitment to public service. Uh, we felt that our graduates should have that uh, engagement with some of the tougher challenges that we face as a country. And that's when we said, listen, this really means that we have to focus on a liberal education. At that time, we took the uh, additional sort of onerous decision to say, listen, if we are going to do this, then let's just do pure liberal arts. Let's not dilute this by bringing in a business school and a law school and an engineering school because that will then uh, completely subvert this mission. That's what led to this. Uh, and uh, honestly, we think that it's an idea whose time has come that, you know, uh, India needs uh, graduates like that. If you look at our the problems that we face as a country, 
uh, you need bright people to engage on the toughest challenges that we face as a country. And our toughest challenges are not just engineering or business or, or legal challenges. The, we need people who bring a multidisciplinary perspective to the solutions uh, of these problems. And a lot of these problems actually don't have solutions. Mm. Uh, so you need people who can grapple and engage with these problems, that they can ask the right questions, they can bring multiple perspectives to the problem, they can pull in people from different areas of expertise to apply them to the problem, to who can understand that the answer is a gray, that they need to pick an answer, try and drive that, if it doesn't work, adapt. Uh, and so uh, we think that just as when we set up ISB, we felt that India needs very high quality managers uh, we now feel that India needs these uh, multifaceted leaders who are committed to engaging with some of our toughest challenges and solving for them. So without leaving the country, they get an American style education in India. Yes, and, and an American style education, uh, that, an education that is, uh, that is informed by the, the, the success of the four-year liberal arts model in the United States, but is also adapted to the Indian context mm. uh, in terms of, you know, for example, uh, our focus on uh, reading, writing and reasoning is much greater than you would see in a U.S. school because the, the school preparation in India on reading and writing, which I'm sure you're aware of, has declined uh, over the years. So how do you bring them back up? to a level uh, that is commensurate with the best in the world mm. means that you have to over invest uh, in that aspect of their education in the college level. Mm. Uh, also bringing in a, a stronger awareness of our own history and our own civilization, not in a jingoistic manner, but in a manner that gives them a greater understanding of where we are uh, and, and why are we where we are and, and what is the potential of us as a country and where we could be. Mm. Uh, we find uh, we are already doing some of this stuff and we find that uh, students just are elated uh, with, with that kind of perspective. Mm. I have two more minutes left. Yeah. So my last two questions the f is going to be Young India Fellow Fellowship. You have started a program. I believe, that is like, part of Ashoka University. Yeah, that's like the Rhodes Scholar. Yes. Yeah, so what we did was uh, the innovation we did with Ashoka was that even before Ashoka happened, we started a program. Huh. for Ashoka. And we said, if you really want to sell liberal arts to India and students and parents and to faculty and academics around the world, let's start a test or a pilot program. A one year. A one year. So let's quickly launch this one year program. Uh, do a liberal arts one year postgraduate. Think of it as a one year master's. Make that a huge success. Get wonderful students, get great faculty, show the success. And that will give people the confidence that actually liberal education works. People get jobs, people are able to do well, and so on. That program was very successful, has been very successful, is, it's in, fifth, it's, is in its fifth year now. And now Ashoka University has adopted that program because it was part of the strategy. Mm. And so now this becomes Ashoka's first postgraduate or master's program. Mm. What did you think of becoming when you were young? I think my lasting memory is of becoming a bus driver, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I, I wasn't ever very sure. I still don't know what I want to become, and I'm one of those uh, who's always been very confused about what I want to do. Uh, but I do think that uh, somewhere uh, there, there has been, I think, always a creative side in me, and uh, I would love to do something more creative than I've done so far in my life. Pramit, if you're not a Renaissance person, I don't know who else can be labeled that. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for stopping by. It was enjoyable. We didn't get to cover a lot of uh, yes. questions. One of them was your media company, 9.9. .9. Maybe the next time you're here, we'll talk to you. Sure. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching. You can catch us next week with another episode and a new uh, guest. And if you missed any of our shows, you can watch them online on our YouTube channel. And as always, thank you for watching. I wanted to